All right. Paul said it this way, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah. When you feel like it, when you don't feel like it. That's right. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good. Good is it? He's good, so good, real good. Each and every day of my life, I bless the Lord for He's good. Hey. I think I got a witness out there. to myself, brother. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good. He's good. So good. Real good. Each and every day of my life, I bless the Lord for He's good. Hey. 
close our eyes to kind of shut everything out. I just want you to close your eyes. Shut everything out. No distractions around you as we lift up this word of praise. Sing. so much every day. Time, money, we use up, we waste so much. We spend time and money every day until it's all gone. Precious resources, powerful resources. What if you, what if you reinvested your time into prayer, your resources into support to help us plant churches, prepare leaders, and proclaim the gospel? What if you became a prayer fellowship partner? GOGF has been planting churches, preparing leaders, and proclaiming the gospel throughout the world since 1961. 14 churches on the eastern seaboard, producing weekly radio broadcasts that reach around the globe. We have ministry training in India, Africa, and the Caribbean. Partner with us. Partner with God. Invest in expanding and supporting His kingdom worldwide. Become a prayer fellowship partner. You have the time and resources to make a difference. and ask for God's help now as we take a look at this portion of scripture, John chapter 18. And Heavenly Father, we bow before you now. We ask that you would speak clearly to each one of us, that uh, we would take to heart individually what you have to say today. And we'll give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's good when you can learn from somebody else's mistakes. It's a good thing when you can watch somebody else trip over the log and then you can step over it yourself. And, uh, and, and that's the kind of thing that we can account for here in John chapter 18. This portion of scripture has to do with Peter uh, as he follows Jesus after the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know the story, he denies him three times. It says, before the rooster crows, you're going to be denied three times. And so we find uh, Peter uh, denying Christ. And normally when you, when you hear messages on John chapter 18, it focuses on the fact that Jesus 
uh, that rather Peter was denying Jesus and, and all the things that, that Peter lacked. But, but what I want to do is I was reading the portion of scripture, it, it dawned on me and what jumped out of the page for me is that, that there were mistakes that Peter made. That his denial three times didn't just come out of a vacuum. It wasn't something that just popped up from nowhere. But that there were at least four mistakes that I want to talk about that Peter made that led up to those denials. And so for you and I today, I want us to, to look at these four mistakes and as we watch Peter trip over those logs, make sure that we can step over them and avoid those logs. Amen? And so join me as we take a look at this portion of scripture and look at these mistakes that Peter made. The first one was that Peter was not where he was supposed to be. Peter was not where he was supposed to be. The text says that he stood outside the door in verse 16. Now, he had followed Jesus and at least another one of the disciples uh, up to the house. And, and unfortunately, he didn't stay in the house. He stayed outside. He stood at the door outside, according to verse 16. His friend went in with Jesus, and that's where Peter should have been. But it's easy sometimes for us to get distracted and to stop following. Following Jesus and find ourselves not where we're supposed to be, not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Is, is there a witness somewhere in the house? Somebody can identify with that? I believe that, that it is possible for us to be distracted. Now, what distracted Peter, according to the text, it doesn't give us a whole lot of details, but it says that there was this servant girl standing at the door. Now, I don't know if the pretty girl at the door got his attention and distracted him away from following Jesus, but, but I, it does remind me that sometimes there are things and people and circumstances that distract us away from being where we're supposed to be. And it might not be that pretty girl in your life. Maybe it is. I don't know. It might not be Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome, although maybe it could be. Uh, but, but, but there are circumstances and issues which oftentimes distract us. Relationships, I believe, are one of the big ones. Relationships distract us away from following Jesus. And whether it's Mr. Tall, Dark, and Handsome or Miss Cutie, uh, the fact of the matter is that we need to make sure that we don't allow those relationships around us to pull us away from God. Amen. Amen. And too many times we allow important relationships to take us away from God. Uh, and so there are a lot of things that distract us, but, but relationships is a big one. Another one that distracts us many times is money. Now, we all need money, right? Everybody needs, needs a little money. But when money becomes so important to us and the pursuit of money becomes a driving force in our life that we make decisions that distract us away from following God, being where we're supposed to be doing and doing what we're supposed to be doing, uh, th that's, that's when money becomes a problem. That's when money becomes an idol. And so many times I believe that we allow money to distract us away from following Jesus. And I want to challenge you, I want to challenge myself and all of us that we need to constantly make sure that we root those idols out of our hearts so that we can follow him and not be distracted. Uh, that pursuit of overtime, that pursuit of uh, the extra dollar, that extra project, uh, that we don't think it's a big deal if we just skip church today to go and chase after an extra dollar. I want to tell you it's those little mistakes those little things those little logs those twigs in the path that you trip over and the next thing you know you're not where you're supposed to be you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing here's a big one family 
especially if you're in a family situation that 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 they don't see the importance of following Jesus the way you do uh, family can be a distraction family can be a hindrance and we need to we need to always make sure that our priority in life is following Jesus amen and, and not, uh, we need to make sure that, that even our very family doesn't become an idol and a hindrance. Uh, and so many times it becomes a distraction in our lives. Uh, and so here we find Peter standing outside because of these distractions. Uh, laziness. Isn't that a distraction? I mean, I said this morning that, you know, Mr. Posturepedic calls our name and Mr. Seely, you know, he calls our name and the next thing you know, you're listening to Mr. Seely and you're not where you're supposed to be. Laziness can hinder us from being where we're supposed to be. And uh, we need to make sure that we don't allow that in our lives. Let me not talk about television. That's a big one. Let me not talk about sports. That's a big one. And, and, and you know, I love sports as much as anybody else. But, but when we allow the pursuit, and, and you know, I can't go to church because I got to see the game. When, when, when it becomes more important than following Jesus, that's the bells should go off. There's a problem. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> And, uh, and so we need to make sure that while many of these things have their place in our lives and we need money and we need relationships and we need family and we need entertainment and, and all those things have their place in our lives, we need to make sure that it never pulls us away from being where we're supposed to be and doing what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. If you don't say it, I'll say it. And so we need, to, we need to always be checking our hearts. Anything that would hinder us uh, needs to be rooted out. Peter was simply not where he was supposed to be. And that was his first mistake. But Peter made another mistake. And that is, at the end of verse 18, we find that Peter also did not stay with the other believing disciples. Uh, look at look at uh, verse 18 now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal stood there for it was cold and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself so Peter made a decision do I follow Jesus and his disciple into the house or do I stay with these soldiers by the warm fire and he made a decision that he was going to leave this other believing disciple and go warm himself by the fire. I want to tell you that it is a mistake when we don't stay with the other believers and we forsake fellowship with the other believers. Somebody needs to hear this. It is a mistake that will lead to disaster when we don't make a high priority of fellowshipping with and staying close to the other believers. And that's why uh, we're told, the writer of Hebrews says that, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together because it's important. Uh, he, he was, Peter was brought into the house, but apparently found himself with the soldiers outside by the fire in the courtyard. And we don't have a lot of detail about how he got back outside, but at some point while he was with that believing disciple, he turned around and left him and went outside by the fire. And I want to tell you, it's a mistake when you walk away from the fellowship of God's people. It's always a mistake. Uh, his friend went to bring him in, according to the text. His friend went out to get him and bring him back in, but, and we don't have a, a lot of how that, that played out, but the bottom line is Peter still found outside by the fire. 
And for some reason, he finds himself separated again with the wrong crowd. Let me tell you something. It is a critical mistake to allow yourself to become separated from Christian friends. You know, the Bible says that, that when one falls, the other one's there to pick them up. That's why we need each other. Uh, the, the, we're, we're told that, that a two-fold cord is not easily broken, or a two-fold cord is stronger than one, a three-fold cord is not easily broken. And, and, and again, the, the idea behind that is, that is that there is strength when we're together. So as we're walking together, if I slip and trip, you can be there to help me get back up. When I get discouraged and down, you can encourage me and we can truck it another mile. Uh, we need each other to help each other through the rough times and the difficulties in life. There is strength as we walk together. And when we allow ourselves to become separated, we find ourselves in a weak place. Now, let me tell you something. I know that church folk are a trip. Hey, I, I understand that we can be a handful. But rather, when, when you run up against some of those tripping church folk, rather than running, it's an opportunity to demonstrate and to build grace. It's an opportunity for us to, to work on forgiveness. It's an opportunity for us to extend that grace in their lives. And I think that sometimes God has some of his people tripping in front of us with all kinds of stuff just to work on us, just to get us to where we need to be. And if you run away from God's people just because they're a handful and hard to deal with sometimes, uh, you miss out on all that. Much less you miss out on the strength and the, and the ability for encouragement that we all need. And, and so I want to tell you that, that it's a mistake to separate ourselves from other believers. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of information out about how young people walk away from the church and walk away from their faith. And uh, how when after they leave high school and they leave their youth group or whatever, they go out and they're, then they're gone and they never come back. One of the predictors that I've found, one of the big predictors is you show me somebody, whether a high school student or a college student, show me who their friends are. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because when they have, when, when your friends are Christian friends, then, then you're going to have the, that strength and encouragement to follow on with Jesus. When your best friends are out there in the world and their priority is not following Jesus, pretty soon you're going to be tripping right along with them. And so I want to, I, I want to, and that's not just good for young people, that's good for all of us. You show me who your significant relationships are with. Who's your best friend? Who are those significant contacts that you have? And, and, and when they are God's people in the house of the Lord, that's the strength that we need. Peter made a big mistake by walking away from the other disciples getting out there all by himself, thinking that he was, oh, who, me, deny you, never. Thinking he was all that all out there by himself. And now let me tell you something. If you think that you can stand up to the wiles of the evil one all by yourself without the fellowship of believers, I want to tell you, you, you got nothing on Peter. You think what he did was bad. Just wait when the devil gets finished with you. And sometimes what we find is that when we get separated, we find ourselves doing things that we never dreamed we would do. We find ourselves committing sin we never thought we would ever commit. 
we find ourselves saying things and stuff coming out of our mouth that we never thought we would, we would ever say or do. Why? Because we, we made that same mistake that Peter made and walked away from the other disciples. And so we need each other. Uh, don't be like Peter and walk away. You know, I've, I've shared before um, the fact that God has blessed this, uh, my ministry to be able to, to travel around the world and to train pastors in different countries. And, and I've been to a lot of countries where orphans are just all over the place. I've shared this before, that, that, that many of these countries where AIDS has just wiped out a whole generation, you have all these children that are running the streets with, uh, with no parents alive. And, and you know what? In the tropical countries, they're not necessarily starving to death. I mean, in some countries they are, but, but in a lot of countries, they're not starving to death. They can climb a coconut tree, and they can grab a mango, and they can find something to eat. They can get food to eat. But, but the, the fact of the matter is that, that without the encouragement and without the discipline and without the accountability of a family and that structure, uh, they'll never grow up to be that well-adjusted citizen, that contributing member of society. And it's the same thing that's true with, with us as believers. You won't necessarily starve to death if you, spiritually, if you don't come to church and don't fellowship with other believers, because you can hear good messages on the radio. You can hear good messages on TV. I always like to say, in fact, you can probably hear better sermons on television than you can going to your local church, because they got the best of the best on the tube. Am I right about it? And so, so you can get good messages. You can hear the word of God expounded. You're, you're not going to starve spiritually, but it's the same dynamic. Without the encouragement, without the discipline, without the accountability, without somebody to speak truth into your life, without somebody to correct you, without somebody who loves you enough to rebuke you, without, without that encouragement to lift you up when you need it, uh, you're you're doomed and you're never going to be all that God wants you to be. You're never going to accomplish in your life what God wants you to accomplish. And so I want to encourage you, don't separate yourself from the fellowship of believers. Somebody hearing me? Amen. Amen. Look at verse 17. We find another mistake. Peter allowed fear to paralyze him. Verse 17 says, then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Now, what do you think when she asked that question, what emotion do you think ran through Peter's body? Fear. Fear. Oh, no. They found me out. I'm in trouble now. And I can imagine fear running through Peter's veins. And he allowed that fear to paralyze him and to stop him from following Jesus, from continuing on into the house with Jesus and the other disciple. He allowed fear to paralyze him. He suffered from fear that stopped him from standing with Jesus through the threats that he faced. Now, you know, there are a myriad of phobias that paralyze people and prevent them from functioning normally. I remember reading about a whole list of all these fears that people have. There's a phobia for just about everything out there. Um, there are children that have become afraid to go to school because they're afraid that their parents will go away while they're in school. There, there are others that are afraid to go to sleep at night out of fear that something bad's going to happen during the night. I hope that's none of, none of you all. Uh, there, there are fears for just about everything uh, and phobias for, for just about everything. But it's a shame when the children of God become fearful of the world and particularly fearful of rejection from the world that paralyzes us and keeps us from sharing the gospel and sharing God's love. Fearful of the loss of friendships that keep us from being truthful with people and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Fearful of the consequences for their faith and the suffering that might come if they continue to follow Jesus and 
and to do and obey what God has asked them to do. And so too often Christians are paralyzed by fear and unable to glorify God with their lives. And I, I want to challenge you that we need to make sure that we can conquer fear in our lives. It's a mistake to let fear paralyze us. Now what is it that conquers fear? Faith. Faith. Oh, who said it? Love. What's the verse say? Perfect love casts out fear. Love is what conquers fear. Faith plays a big role in that too. In fact, the love is what produces faith in us. But, 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 but love conquers fear. Now, how does that work? Well, stop and think about it with me. Fear when I'm afraid of whether it's consequences or pain or suffering or discomfort in my life, I become afraid and that fear is self-focused. Fear is concerned about me. Fear is wanting me to, to avoid some difficulty or some pain. Love works in the opposite direction to fear. Love is putting the needs of the other person ahead of yourself. Love says, I'm willing to sacrifice myself for you. Love works in the opposite direction. And so when I love you enough to share the gospel with you, even though I know you're going to cause pain to me, uh, I, my love for you and concern for you is greater than my concern for myself. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so we need to make sure that we love God and love our neighbor. And when we love God and love our neighbor, it not only fulfills all the law and the prophets, it casts out fear. If you want to have victory over fear in your life, no matter what area or, or what it's about, you need to put your eyes on Jesus. You need to learn to love him more. And as you focus on God, what ends up happening is that the fear subsides. When you get a handle on how big and great and wonderful God is, when you can see that God is bigger than any problem that you have, when you can understand what an awesome God we serve, what's there to be afraid of? When you understand that your life is in his hands, that we can cast all of our cares upon him, knowing that he cares for us. When you have that kind of a love relationship going on with God, you can walk with your head up and your chest out, and there is no need for fear. Amen. Amen. Peter didn't see that. Peter saw a trial. He saw the consequences. He didn't want to get caught up in all that. And he was trying to protect himself. And that protection of himself allowed the fear to just uh, paralyze him. Uh, let, me, let me take you to Moses. Here's a good case study on conquering fear. Moses in Exodus 14, 13 gave the Israelites three steps to follow in conquering fear. Exodus 14, 13, he says three things. First of all, he told, Moses told the Israelites to stand still. Stand still. And let, let me tell you something. When your focus is on God and you have a good picture of how big and wonderful God is, it allows you to stand still on his promises. No matter what the circumstances look like, no matter what the situation might be like, you can stand still and relax and kick back on the promises of God because you understand that God is bigger than your problems. Yeah. Second thing he said, not only stand still, but see the salvation of the Lord. Because after all, it's his battle. After all, it's, 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 it's his concern. And so you can cast your cares on him because you are in his hand.
And so we not only stand still, but we can see the salvation of the Lord. I like that. Uh, as we fall in love with him and trust him more. And then the third thing in Exodus 14 and verse 16, the, the Lord said that the children of Israel shall go on dry land. Uh, so they're told to go. And so they're told, first of all, to stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, and then move out and go. And I want to tell you, that's a good case study on conquering fear. The first thing, when you find yourself in a fearful situation, the first thing you need to do is to stand still and see God. Amen. Just remember how big and wonderful he is. Just remember what an awesome God. Maybe a little time of praise and worship. Amen. You in the shower Amen. is a good thing. And just remember how awesome God is. Stand still on the promises of God. And, and then learn to wait and just see the salvation of the Lord. You know, the battle's not yours. If it was limited to what I can do or what you can do, we'd all be in trouble. But the salvation belongs to the Lord, and he is able to do more than we could even imagine. And then we go, and we walk, and we obey, and we follow, and we do what he calls us to do. Amen? Amen. The final mistake that I want to share with you is in verse 18. Verse 18 he says, now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now, check this out. Here's Peter. As I said, he's got the house on one side. There's a trial going on. There's probably an execution that's about to happen over there. And he's got the fire and the warm coals on a cold night. And what does he choose? He chooses the coals. He chooses to warm himself on a cold night. Now, nobody can blame him on a cold night for warming himself. Nobody can say, oh, that was sinful to go and warm himself by the, by the coal. The problem is that he chose to comfort himself rather than to stay in fellowship and follow Jesus. He chose his own personal comfort over the call of God on his life. Now, if that doesn't grab you, I want to tell you, there are many more of us. And see, I see your minds already thinking about who else should be hearing this. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that many of us make that same decision. We choose comfort and ease over hardship and work. And we'll choose that seven days out of seven every week. Amen. Amen. You know, I just um, came back from a mission trip, and uh, one of the ladies at the, on the mission trip said to me, oh, this isn't as bad as I thought. I thought, you know, mission trip, I thought, you know, the bugs and everything was going to, you know, this wasn't as, as bad as I, as I thought. And, uh, and I almost didn't come because, you know, what, what was in her mind about a, what a mission trip was going to be like. And, and I thought to myself, you know, how many other people didn't come because they thought, that uh, I'm not going to where the bugs are. I'm not going to sleep on those beds. What kind of hotel are we staying in? <laughs> you know, we, we choose comfort over following Jesus and we'll do it seven days a week and justify it in our minds. We'll choose TV over VBS this week. <laughs> Come on now, am I just telling the truth? Yeah. We'll choose ease over inconvenience every time we get a chance. That was the big mistake that Peter made. Peter chose the ease and the warmth of the coals and the fire. You could just imagine him on a cold night. Whoo, this feels good. And because he made that choice of comfort 
and convenience over following Jesus into the house, we find in the next several verses that he denies Jesus over and over. And so, well, I guess all I'm saying is, is that don't look at just how terrible Peter was by denying Jesus three times. It didn't jump up out of a vacuum. It didn't come from nowhere. It came out of a series of bad decisions that he made. It came out of a, a lot of small steps in the wrong direction. And that's what happens in our lives. We, we, we make a series of small steps in the wrong direction. And the next thing you know, we're doing stuff that we never thought we would ever do. So I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And I wonder if we can, in just quiet prayer between you and God, if we can make a couple of resolves and fresh commitments to the Lord. First of all, let's resolve to make sure that we're always where God wants us to be, doing what God wants us to do. Can you say that prayer? Can you ask God to help you to always be where God wants you to be? Let's pray that we will never get separated from the fellowship and strength of God's people. Amen. Can that be your prayer? That will never allow some idiot to pull you away from the fellowship of God's people. Let's pray for the love of God and the love for others that will work in the opposite direction to our selfish fear. That will conquer fear in our lives. And then finally, let's pray that the idolatry of comfort and ease will not hinder us from the hardships of following Jesus. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would cause that these fresh commitments made by your people would not be easily snatched away. Help us to learn from Brother Peter Help us to not make those same mistakes, but help us to follow hard after you, to be disciples that, that, that obey you, that we're where we're supposed to be, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Bless each one, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name.